welcome to the first mini episode of Real Life Ghost Stories. How you do? I believe it's episode 63, I think. Are we going to, oh, we're not starting a new number on? No, we're not. We're going to keep going. Number Wang. Do you know number Wang? No. Okay. Google it. Okay. Okay. I'll <laughs> Google it then. So we've decided to try and release two episodes a week, which is a bit mad. I don't know why. I've Basically, there's kind of two opposing teams on this one where some people prefer the researched episodes and some people prefer the listener stories and some of you love all of it and some of you love all of it but when i put the polls on instagram whatever it was pretty 50 people were like whether they'd prefer research stories or listener stories or whatever if you can hear that scratching in the background it's That's Bim. Bim just letting you know all know that she's here Bim, stop it so what we're going to do is we're going to try and do a mini episode on a wednesday so no Patreons, no film reviews, nothing like that. Just you telling us about your scary experiences. Yeah, pretty much. My voice is so husky. <laughs> yeah, Dan's sick, so his voice is really husky right now. And he keeps <laughs> nearly choking and dying. So just don't die on the podcast. Although it would be Although, like... Although that would be the premium <sighs> episode, wouldn't it? Right? Imagine the downloads. Right. Man dies on podcast. I know, right? So are you ready for our first story? Yeah. No, no, actually I'm not. I'm just, I'm in the comfort zone from the main episode. The first story comes from Ashley. Oh. Thank you, Ashley, for sending in your yeah, story. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. I've always been a bit of a scaredy cat. Me too. I never quite grew out of the afraid of the dark stage. I'm a grown-ass woman and I still have to turn every freaking light on in every room on my way to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I wish that I could just choke it all up to an overactive imagination. But sadly, that is not the case. Sometimes I think that I attract those things that go bump in the night. Ever since I was a little girl, I can remember that feeling of absolute dread at night time, or even when being home alone during the day. I never experienced anything more than that in my childhood home, but even to this day, that house makes me feel uneasy from time to time. The real scary shit didn't happen until I got older. The first house of my husband, Nick and I, ever lived in together was a tiny little cottage on a large patch of farmland that shared a driveway and yard with a barn and another larger house. The landlord's brother, Sam, lived in the house next to our cottage and we all got along really well. It was great. A month or so after moving in, hunting season started, which meant that I would be spending a lot of time alone at the house. Nick is an outdoorsman and we live off everything he brings home. So during hunting season, it is not rare for him to be gone from before dawn until after nightfall. One day, About two or three in the afternoon, I was sitting with our dog, Duke, on the couch, watching TV. It had gotten a bit too noisy outside because Sam and some of the farm staff were finishing taking down the old barn across the driveway from our house, so I closed the front door and went to sit back down on the couch. All of a sudden, this overwhelming feeling of pure terror washed over me. It was the middle of the damn day and the house was bright and sunlit, so I was extremely confused about why I was feeling this way. I brushed it off and just assumed it was because I don't like being home alone. A few minutes later, my coffee cup tipped over on our coffee table. It was empty, so I figured that it just blew over by a random breeze, even though all of the doors and windows were shut. I went to pick up the cup when it began to roll down the length of the coffee table. I froze as I watched it roll to the end of the table, stopped for a moment and then slowly roll back to the opposite end. My mind was screaming at me to run the fuck away, but I'm a firm believer that acknowledging these things only makes it worse. I picked up the cup and threw it away, then texted Nick to tell him what happened and that I was freaking out. Of course he told me that I needed to relax, and it was nothing to be afraid of. But things only got worse from there. A few weeks later we were laying in bed watching TV late at night, and were startled by the sound of loud banging outside. At first, it sounded like the front door to Sam's house slamming. Then the sound moved to the front of our house, like someone was opening and closing the car doors. Nick went outside to take a look around and found nothing. Later that night, we were woken up by the bedside alarm going off at 3am, when it was set to go off at 6am. Thinking he had made a mistake, Nick reset the alarm for 6am and we fell back to sleep. The alarm went off four more times, between 3.30am and 5am, until Nick ripped the alarm from the wall and threw it across the room out of anger and exhaustion. Five minutes later, the alarm went off again. Oh my God. 
but this time the display flashed 6-6 go. Neither was went back to sleep after that. In the morning Nick was approached by Sam who was asking him if we'd heard the loud banging coming from the driveway. It turns out that he had heard the same banging that we did but he thought it started with our front door banging. He had just assumed that maybe we had gotten into an argument or something and didn't want to come outside and intrude. Nick and Sam talked for a while about this strange occurrence and about what we experienced with the alarm clock. Sam admitted that some strange things were happening in his house as well. As time went by, little things would happen here and there. Strange noises, items going missing, nothing too serious, but still creepy. I talked to my mother-in-law about what was going on and she suggested blessing the house. We aren't religious people, but we have a strong faith and spiritual beliefs. She made me a blessing oil, prayed over it and told me what to do to bless the house. I went home, performed the blessing in every room and instantly fell better. It stayed that way for a few months. And then it came back with a vengeance. The atmosphere in the house changed slowly at first. I started getting those feelings back more and more often, but tried to rationalise and talk myself out of it. One evening, Nick and I were in the shower together. Honestly, we did just often just to save hot water. When something flew into the shower curtain, hard, and landed on the floor. We both jumped back against the shower wall, scared shitless and afraid to look on the other side of the curtain. After mustering up the courage to look, we found that it was my body spray which is always sitting on the shelf above the sink. The only way the bottle would be able to land where it did was if it were to be thrown at the shower or if it somehow levitated off the shelf and took a 90 degree turn towards the shower. It was fucking impossible. Nothing physical ever happened again in that house after that, but the atmosphere of the house just rapidly declined. The dog and cats started acting strangely and skittish. Nick and I began fighting constantly with each other and we were always on edge and anxious. There is no other way for me to describe the feeling to you than just absolute oppressive hatred and fear. Sam's demeanour also began to change radically. He became mean and creepy. Something just wasn't right. At one point, I found him going after Duke, chasing him in the yard. I don't know what he would have done to that dog if I hadn't come outside and questioned what he was doing. Things got so out of control that, that Sam actually threatened Nick's life for reasons that I can't even remember now. This was when we realised that we needed to go out of that house and off of that godforsaken farm. We packed up our shit in one day and never looked back. A few months later, Nick ran into one of the farm staff, Rob, at the gas station in town. They talked at length about what had been going on at the house and Rob told Nick something very interesting. Apparently, the barn that they were taking down when we first moved into the cottage used to have another apartment in it. In the apartment lived a mother and her teenage son and we came to find out that the son had hanged himself in the barn apartment a few years before we moved to the farm. Maybe it's just a coincidence that all of the activity started shortly after the barn being torn down, but I don't really think so. I'd also love to be able to say that moving out of the cottage was the end of my paranormal experiences, but unfortunately, this story isn't the one that keeps me up at night. Oh, what? That's a cliffhanger. It'll keep me up at night as well. Well... Ashley, you said at the end of your email, should you send us the other stories? And fuck me, yes, you no. should. No, please don't. Please do. No, you aren't. Mm. So what are your thoughts on that story? Uh, yeah, it's real creepy, isn't it? I don't like the stuff being moving. It's a bit aggressive because it was thrown at them, wasn't it? Yeah. I feel like poor guys just messing up your kitchen is frustrating. Like it yeah. freaked me out Yeah. And I would hate it. But it's really frustrating. But if it but wasn't aimed at you, if it wasn't threatening, if it wasn't aggressive, you'd just get to a point where yeah. you'd be like, oh, that's annoying. Yeah, because kids do that. Kids and poltergeists are yeah. essentially the same thing. Yeah, freaky. <laughs> <laughs> that laugh. was good. I like that. <laughs> Don't laugh. Dan can't laugh because he'll start into a mm. coffin fit. So um, yeah, so started off quite innocuous and then got quite heavy and then stopped and then it was the oppression, like just the the dark feeling of it, which is weird, isn't it? And it makes you wonder whether actually whether it was the the young lad who killed himself, yeah, doing the stuff. Or if it was the stuff that killed the young lad, got the young lad to kill himself. Or what the fuck was banging around outside the house? The people on the roof. That, oh, don't. 
I'm not okay after the people on the roof scenario. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to episode 62 and I tell the story about my nephews. Yeah, because that whole banging outside the house makes me think like skinwalkery. Yeah. Or just that fuck, something really fucking angry. But it's always banging doors, isn't it? We could be black eyed kids trying to get in. Uh, why would you say that? Well, knocking on doors. Oh, that it? story's really giving me the heebie jeebies, and I don't know why. Like, I have <laughs> that feeling where I want to take my legs out from under the table. I think it's the fact that it's quite creepy on its own, and then Ashley says, but that's not the one that keeps us up at night. Whoa. Yeah, babe, you need to send in your, your stories. Also. I remember something from the last episode that made me laugh. What? Oklahoma home. <laughs> when you said Oklahoma home, it was funny. It's not funny now because it's out of context, but it just came into my head. Because it's like Oklahoma Homer. home. I, yeah, it's not funny. I'm a delirium again. <laughs> it's that cough syrup. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what's happening. No. I don't know what's no, happening. No. Would you um, like another Ash- story? Yeah, mm, uh, no. I actually don't because it's kind of creepy. Okay. I was quite happy with 62 because it was kind of like... Oh, it was yeah, It was just interesting. Just it. it was like it's like that time we talked about like near-death experiences. Yeah. It wasn't freaky. It was just interesting. And now you're just freaking me out again. And now I'm just fucking shit up. I'm loving it. Our next story is from Roxanne. 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 This first one is about my sister. We had just moved to a new apartment unit with a second bedroom so that me and my siblings could finally have a room of our own. Previously, we slept in the living room because we were too poor to afford more than one room. My sister took this as an opportunity to have a sleepover with her new friend, Sophia, of whom I had an uneasy feeling. In the night, while my brother slept in the bottom bunk and I watched from the top bunk, Sophia taught my sister how to make a homemade Ouija board. At the time, we were still very new to American pop culture, as we were barely integrating as first-gen Asian Americans. Furthermore, we were raised Buddhist, so neither of us knew what a Ouija board was, nor that she was teaching my sister to make them with the upside down pentagram for the home position. While they played, I fell asleep. I've no idea how long they were going for, but I woke to screams. Sophia and my sister were freaking out because apparently a tennis ball that they had had next to them had rolled about three feet. I want to point out here that Sophia did not teach my sister the proper rules to playing on a Ouija board, so they never said goodbye and never closed any sessions. Rules that my sister would pass on to me when we played. Along with the other weird occulty things Sophia showed my sister, including a very disturbing picture of a grey that she had caught. Fuck off. What? Fuck off. No. (laughs) Oh my God. No, that's uh, like the instant picture in my head is that fucking scene from The Sixth Sense when they're watching that news clip. Of the child's birthday party and they see that big fucking alien. Yep. Sorry, I'm not... Right. Are you ready to continue? Because I... This is great because you're the one getting freaked out. She introduced my sister to Martita, the ghost of a girl who apparently died in a fire. The way to contact her was similar to the Charlie Charlie game. You played with six pencils and at least two people. Nothing remarkable ever happened when they played, but my sister said it was a weird sensation. When I contacted Martita... I didn't really believe it, as it seemed like something that could be manipulated by the other person. But the sensation I got every time we spoke was jarring. My neck, shoulders and spine would tingle, and my hands holding the pencils would go ice cold. It felt like someone was leaning over me to guide my hands as we played. I'm certain that these events made us more susceptible to paranormal happenings. A few years later, we were fortunate enough to move into a house where each child had their own room. My sister and her boyfriend Carlos were talking about getting married, even though they were still young. They were so in love. In 2002, Carlos died of a drowning as he tried to save another swimmer. My sister was so distraught, and even to this day, believes that if he had survived, they'd be happily married with children. A few months passed after his burial, and my sister is up late one night recording songs for a mixtape off the radio. When she played it back from the beginning, She said no music played, only the sound of a strong wind. After about 10 seconds, she claimed that she could hear moaning. She said the voice sounded like Carlos, and that, though it wasn't very clear, she could hear her name being spoken. When it was over, the music played, as if the recordings had been pushed back to make room. She was so shaken by this that she recorded over it and cried her eyes out. She's refused to talk about it ever since. My partner never believed in paranormal experiences until he met me. 
His family were moderately wealthy, so they could afford to build a new house for themselves. It was in a developing neighbourhood, so the land hadn't been used recently for anything else. It was a nicely sized house with two storeys and an attic that was accessed by a mini door, not a hatch, from the same room upstairs. I'm definitely not psychic, but I've always been a bit sensitive to weird energy and this mini door gave me the heebie-jeebies. During the day, nothing ever felt wrong, so I felt comfortable enough to travel around the house on my own. One afternoon, I was feeling exhausted, so he told me to go upstairs and nap in his bed while he and his mom made dinner. Through his open bedroom door, you can see the mini door directly across the hall. I turned my back to it and fell into a good nap until I was stirred by someone coming towards me. I laid in bed with my eyes open, feeling hazy, when the voice whispered loudly, Hey! I didn't respond. I felt this person walk to the foot of the bed, where he whispered again, louder this time, Hey! Something felt off. After a few minutes, the presence left the room, and I fell back to sleep, only to be woken again with another loud whisper, this time a woman's voice. Hey! I didn't move, and I didn't open my eyes. Something told me that I shouldn't. This new presence walked from the door, frame right up to the bed where I laid, leaned over me and whispered into my ear, Hey! I've no memory of what happened after that. My partner woke me up a while, a-, a while later, calling me down to dinner. I asked him why he and his mom had come upstairs to whisper at me. He looked confused and told me that they had been downstairs the entire time and no one had come up. My bones chilled and I asked him not to leave me alone upstairs again. He didn't understand, but he promised me he wouldn't. Later on I told him about what had happened to me while we were out, because I didn't dare speak about it in the house, and advised him that if anything tried to contact him not to acknowledge it. He didn't understand, but didn't try to dispute it and believed in my experience, on account of how shaken I was. I acknowledged that I could have been half asleep, but the way this felt, I know I was fully conscious. I told my partner that I didn't get good feelings about that mini door, and he said he'd look into it, even though he knew top and bottom of the house. A few years later, we were on a video chat during the night. My mic was on mute because I was doing something else, and he was watching a movie, so he wasn't wearing the headphones. And because his parents were sleeping downstairs, he had the volume down. Halfway through the movie, he heard my voice calling his name several times behind him, where his back was turned to the door, through which he could see the mini door. Per my advice, he didn't acknowledge it and didn't tell me about it until we were away from the house. I was chilled to learn that whatever this was could mimic me. Another few years passed by with no incidences until one night, We're up late in the game room, working on a harness with wings for my cosplay. He tells me he wants to get some water from the kitchen downstairs and I beg him not to leave me alone as I can't go with him because the wings are cumbersome to go downstairs in. He says I'll be back in a minute and goes down the stairs in front of me. I'm standing there alone, actually feeling okay with being there by myself. Until I hear my partner's voice calling my name over my shoulder. Oh no... It tells me to turn around and I feel sick because I've come to the realisation that I'm standing not five feet from the mini door with my back to it. I felt like I was paralysed in place and almost cried when my partner reappeared. There was no music playing and you couldn't hear anything going on in the kitchen downstairs. To this day, I still don't know what those things wanted with me. I've never had an experience like this before or since. And I hope to never find out what it wanted. Hell yeah, I'm with you on that. Oh my no, gosh, I hate mimics. Fuck. I did start laughing halfway through it though. Is why? Do, why were you laughing? Because you know the haze. Yeah. I was like, is it just the lumineers? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to do it right. Hey! <laughs> was, oh my god, the lumineers are back. Can somebody please get rid of them? <laughs> Uh, yeah sorry no that was really creepy though that was I hate the idea of a mimic of something like a spirit that can mimic other people's voices yeah because can you imagine Mm. if you because if you were here and you heard me calling you downstairs you'd go you'd be like what is it or you'd go downstairs I reckon Bim's a mimic do you (laughs) oh she'd be a great mimic she'd just be like Dan get me chicken snacks and you'd be like why the fuck does everyone want chicken snacks (laughs) And you'd be like, okay. No, she wouldn't even. She's too clever for that. She'd literally make you say, oh, Dan, don't forget to feed Bims. Feed Bims, Dan. 
Give Bims a clean slate. She hasn't been fed yet. <laughs> I swear. I swear this isn't Bims. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's creepy. And what is in that door? Why is it the mini door? I think a part of me would need to go through the door. No, I'd but, have to no, go and see. end up in Narnia. Mm, I don't know <laughs> if Narnia is that... Is Narnia that threatening? I don't know. I've never read the books. I've never seen the films. I don't know. I mean, it's, it depends what era of Narnia you go into, but... Okay, fair enough. There's this is clearly far more complex than I'd anticipated. Yeah. Uh, yeah, horrific. Yeah, not good. Not good at all. Is it like a mini door to a crawl space as well? Because crawl space oh, is creepy. Crawl spaces are not good. They're not good at all. No. Somebody was messaging me because they're in they're they're in a hospital stay at the moment, and every hospital they've been in has had a crawl space, and oh, they're like, because no. you know, in hospitals they have those yeah. maps of like what blueprints yep. of the layout of the building, and she's like, why is there always a crawl space? <laughs> Oh, like good. I think about his dear David, and I'm yeah. like, oh god, it's not good. It's not, not good. good at all. And then even just in the natural realm, like crawl spaces, and you know, remember when that guy came to get rid of the wasp's nest, and he was like, oh yeah, the crawl spaces are the worst when you just walk into them and you can't get out. Oh yeah, so th- we had a wasp nest that these wasps nested in in our kitchen wall, which was traumatic for everybody involved. And <laughs> this guy came to get rid of them, and he was like talking about fucking horrific crawl, crawl spaces. He was like, yeah, sometimes you go into them, you just can't get out again, and I was like. Oh God! He was like, "Or well, sometimes you go into them and they're just full of fucking wasps." Yeah, I mean, that's horrific. Yep. Oh yeah, cool spaces, guys. Burn them down. Yep. There you go. That's it, really. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. Two stories for you. Thanks, ladies. And uh, thanks for listening. And on that note, Dan's looking really upset with me. On that note, we shall see you next week. Bye. Bye.